How's everybody doing today? I am your host, Rich, here on behalf of Rich TV Live with our very special guest, Eric Anderson, the CEO of Fiore Cannabis. How are you doing today, Eric? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Very excited to have you on the show again. Great to be back and uh, weather improving here in Alberta. I'm uh, off to BC again next week. Uh, I, I assume that the uh, flowers will be in bloom out there for you guys shortly. So uh, hopefully spring around the corner here. I hope so. And if you do, yeah, yeah, when you come to BC, maybe we can get together. Absolutely. My last trip there was a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of a reminder and normalcy. I was able to get out with some people and of course, you know, distancing and, and, and staying safe and all that kind of stuff. But it was uh, it was great to get out there. Uh, we, we love seeing the green stuff, uh, both on the on the ground as well as there seems to be some good money flow out that way. I was talking to a large number of uh, investment firms and everybody very interested in this space. And I think the reason that they're interested in taking meetings with me is you know, again, a multi-state operator generating revenue in the U.S. So it's a big topic right now. Yeah. And, you know, your stock is still in the 20 cent range, 25 cent range, 20 to 25 cent. And you're, you're mentioning revenue generator. For our community, revenue is everything. Why do you think Vegas is going to be such a huge revenue generator for Fiora Cannabis? So it was interesting when I first took the job and even before, you know, kind of in my interview process with the board, I traveled down to Vegas and I really wanted to understand the marketplace because I hadn't been there in years. I uh, just for personal reasons hadn't kind of swung around again to do the Vegas thing. And, you know, the first thing I did is I, I started going around and meeting people within the ecosystem, mostly dispensaries, but other grows, other production houses. And just meeting some of the brand generators, the, the first thing that was a real surprise to me coming from Canada or even Alberta, where there's, I think Alberta's got more than 500 dispensaries just in the, uh, in the province here, is it's a limited marketplace, right? I think that uh, the Cannabis Compliance Board, the CCB, advertises somewhere around 60, 70 licenses for retail and uh, 60, 70 licenses for cultivation. So having two of those cultivation licenses, we actually just announced the sale of, of, of one of them, and I'll get back to that in a minute, but a closed market. So, you know, I'm thinking about Las Vegas, I'm thinking about some of the statistics that I was researching. So 42 million visitors a year. Wow. Uh, again, when the pandemic ends, we expect to see that, that that place goes off the hook. You know, it's, it's relatively around 120,000 people a day on airplanes coming in. I think there's a big pent up demand down there for people just wanting to travel and, you know, experience that Vegas lifestyle again. But again, the fun part of my job was going around talking to the owners and general managers of the retail dispensaries. And there's probably about two dozen of them right in the Las Vegas area, some of them very close to the strip. And the first thing that popped out after, you know, this is a limited market is, wow, the sales are strong the retail margins and pricing, you know, I, I kind of came back to Canada and had to do a relook. So I looked on the BC site and I looked on the AGLC site and, you know, top shelf flower in Alberta, for instance, sort of sells at somewhere between 150 and $200 an ounce. So that's the top shelf. Um, again, with some superior genetic strains that we have, we go, grow in an organic living soil platform. The uh, retail price and all currency convert this to Canadian is well over $500 an ounce. So you've got 150, Ooh. 200 here, and you've got wow. north of 500 at some of the big dispensaries that have that brand recognition. And Hey, this is a place to come and not just for tourists, but a lot of locals there as well too. So um, the fun part of the job is going around and kind of doing your market research. And I'd like to say that we've probably narrowed down our retail partnerships as a cultivator to no, uh, we've probably got about 15 that, that we're really close to. And then when we came uh, into the new year here in January, we started uh, our, our organic living soil drop menu drops. And those, uh, those menus weren't on the uh, street for more than about 48 hours before they were completely sold out. So we've got some really strong adoption of our story. And I kind of liken it to not sure if you've ever been to Whole Foods, but you can go buy a pack of, uh, you know, uh, organic spaghetti and, uh, you know, you'd pay two or three dollars for it at a, at a regular superstore and you're paying nine, 10, 12, 15 dollars for it at a Whole Foods. That's that's kind of the the take we have on the market as an organic cultivator. And, and then the dispensaries are more than happy to put us on the top shelf. So can you break down the input costs, licensing fees, wholesale flower pricing margins, production opportunities and retail revenues and mergers and acquisitions? 
Sure. So, you know, the input costs, we um, built out what I call a pharmaceutical grade facility in North Las Vegas. And one of the things that I recognized when I first came on board is that while the, the facility was really good, they had kind of uh, not gone ahead with what I consider to be the highest end lights. So we, we went and replaced all the lights. We went to a Fluence Viper LED. Uh, we had kind of checked that across our networks throughout North America. And it's, uh, it's a high yielder. It's, it's great for, uh, you know, it lowers your energy consumption, kind of keeps your temperatures in line. So what we did is, is we, we, you know, the company had, had spent a lot of money on the facility. And so we just upgraded in the form of the lights. And then we implemented uh, this organic living soil uh, system that kind of came from our guys out of the BC interior, our legacy kind of consultants and growers. And when you look at, again, when I'm signing all the checks for all the supplies and everything, it's, it's not uh, for the faint of heart because we had to, again, put the investment into the new lights. We upgraded the HVAC, upgraded the water RO system. And then when we put the living soil together, you know, that soil was, you know, five, six thousand dollars per room. Wow. And then all of the nutrition, nutritional amendment packs that we've continued to buy, uh, which includes, you know, earthworms, uh, crickets for uh, basically dealing with, uh, you know, just trying to keep that organic platform alive. And uh, it's it's a real wonder you think that you're in, in some kind of a nature reserve because you've got all kinds of different things growing in the soil. The nice thing is when you when you invest up front into that high end of a, of a growing methodology and platform, um, it kind of pays for itself because we don't have to throw that, throw that soil out and it just keeps getting better and better and better. So um, it, was, it was obviously important that we got into the state because it's a closed state for licensing. Uh, we actually had two licenses because once upon a time, there was this thought that one license would equate to X number of square feet. So you'd need to have multiple licenses and the CCB kind of did away with that. So we were able to, to basically be left with an additional cultivation license. And we just uh, sold that and, and news released that the other day. So the good news is that, uh, you know, we've got a superior A plus grade facility. We're kicking out extremely strong yields, extremely strong testers. Our biggest challenge right now is with the genetic strain library of, of more than 50 strains, we're trying to determine which ones are we going to go ahead with here on a, on a, on a crop over crop basis, because we kind of have experimented with uh, some of the traditional high yielders and high testers, but we've got some of those esoteric uh connoisseur uh, uh, type strains as well too that we're experimenting with because what I've really learned in the in the period of the pandemic is that tourism is great for that city don't get me wrong but uh, you know the locals there they they enjoy the product and they enjoy the lifestyle and the culture that comes along with it so to be regarded as a top shelf organic cultivator uh, it's going very well and it's really justifying all those high input costs that we uh, we essentially ourselves even stepped up to in the, in the form of loans to make this happen because we knew that there was going to be payoff. And now as we enter 2021, it's, uh, it's been great to see that that payoff's happening. So uh, we've, we've sort of, you know, in, in our growing rooms, we sort of look at the number of lights and we say, we want to see X pounds per light. Uh, a lot of the people that we interviewed when we, uh, when we went out and hired a brand new, uh, you know, top notch, grow team was we said, hey, what typically do you see for pounds per light if we were to use that as a metric for yield? And they came back and said, hey, when they were around, you know, one pound, one and a half pounds, maybe upwards of two. Well, we've sort of formulated ourselves based upon uh, two pounds per light yield. And then our guys in Canada using the very same technology, very same growing methodologies and protocols, uh, they can get up to 3.5, 3.8 pounds per late. So almost double what that average yield is in, uh, in the Nevada market. And so that's why we're trying to take a little bit of that BC bud magic and we're just trying to implement it down south. Happy to report that our, our grow team down there, very experienced guys, top guys in the state. They've, uh, they've thrown their arms around this living soil protocol and the methodology. And uh, they're really kicking it into gear now with some high, high yields. And then when those test results come back to the, the Las Vegas market, they really want to see the high THC. So definitely north of 25, 26% and definitely over 30%. And we know we can get there as well too. So some really good things to it's coming down. We, we invest a lot of money into this facility. It, it, it does have expansion capabilities and we're working on another 25,000 square foot expansion right now where we're trying to determine which platform do we go for. We sort of keep it 
you know, sort of small batch and kind of purpose built uh, in terms of the facility, or do we go into say a hybrid greenhouse? Uh, we've got uh, some, some real knowledge of uh, using grow containers and using sort of modular systems as well too. So we're just dis deciding which avenue we wanna go down for expansion. And the cool thing about our LOI that we signed with Allied Health, ironically out of Kelowna, but they have manufactured a 9,000 square foot facility just south of Las Vegas and Henderson. And uh, it's with a company called Extreme Cubes and they're gonna be moving that 9,000 square feet onto our site because we've got seven acres, we've got the land to do it there. We can sign a management contract, a rev share and essentially double our square footage here in the next, I'd be surprised if it took three to four months, it's essentially ready to go. So we've got some real growth plans uh, relative to our seven acres footprint there. And we've already got those great relationships downstream into the retail market, so. So with our community, we love companies that are undervalued, underappreciated, underexposed, tight share structure, strong management team. And it seems as though you, you're literally checking off all the boxes. And we love getting into companies early. And we're talking about a company right now that is you know, between 20 and 25 cents. It's gone as high as 30 cents since we've been talking about it. So still very undervalued considering you're going to be generating some substantial revenue. Can you talk about some of the revenue expectations for the company, um, you know, maybe month to month or throughout the rest of 2021 and beyond? Yeah, for sure. So we've also got a dispensary over in Palm Springs and Desert Hot Springs and the Coachella Valley. So when you look at the last reported fiscal year end, uh, our company did about $2.9 million in top line revenue. Um, going forward, we've actually been able to, through some additional marketing delivery service, and basically just, uh, you know, making sure that we were, we were the store in the Coachella Valley that people wanted to come to in light of, you know, tourism not being at levels and, and concerts and festivals not being at levels that uh, heretofore uh, have been expected there. We've actually been able to take that store. Uh, we're, we're estimating about a $2 million a year uh, top line for it in 2021. Nice. We could probably, probably get it up, you know, as, as high as 2.5. Wow. And again, we sort of need the tourism industry to come back and help us with that. But we made that, that store profitable about six months into my tenure. And I just celebrated my one year anniversary. So that's good news is that we can show that, you know, what I'd like to go back to investors with is say, hey, that, you know, the company, in, you know, prior to my arrival posted uh, uh, about 2.9 million. And then when you look at our cultivation and again, getting top dollar for our wholesale uh, cannabis products into the Las Vegas market, I've really looked at this and said, we're gonna for sure double revenues this year. If we don't do $6 million, I'd be very surprised. And uh, you know, really, if you look at our harvest schedule, you look at those yields and those, those tests that are coming out and going into the Las Vegas market, I could see that we could actually triple sales. We could be up, you know, north of eight, nine million dollars top line this year. And the way that I'm running the business is, again, every time that we're putting top line revenue, we are getting a corresponding sort of between 15 and 25 percent on a month over month basis, uh, right down to the bottom line as well, too. So every successive crop that comes out, we just we're trying to maximize the amount, amount of wholesale dollars we're getting in, in Vegas. The dispensary continues to do well on a month over month basis. So um, I don't wanna go uh, too too far out there, but I think that we'll double sales this year, uh, clean up the balance sheet, share structure, we've really cleaned up as well too. So it's tightly held, hardly anything for a, for a float. You know, we're talking 20, 25 million shares on 135 million issued and outstanding and a fairly low profile uh, on our debt side. And, and, you know, if we can kind of close off that deal uh, and solicit a BC to essentially exit the Canadian market and, uh, you know, basically selling off a, a non-revenue generating asset, uh, we'll have really cleaned up the balance sheet. And again, I, I think the stock is, is, is quite undervalued. I haven't really tried to promote and set, you know, set, set as much, but you know, in, our, in my perspective, it was like, let's get the fundamentals established here. We did the name change on uh, November 5th to Fiore. And uh, I sort of liken that data, probably the day that we could say that the turnaround had happened. We still got a few more things to do, but we were sitting at nine cents. So, you know, if we could finish today at, you know, 25, 27 cents, that's a triple. And I don't even think that we've got started yet. I think we've got a long way to go. And if you look at our expansion, uh, kind of, you know, organic expansion that we're going to build out, uh, both in on our seven acres of land in North Las Vegas, 
as well as on the two and a half acres of land that we've got in the Coachella Valley and Palm Springs, you know, we're starting to look at if we could fold in, you know, a, a retail dispensary in Las Vegas, so vertically integrated California, vertically integrated Nevada, you know, this starts to become an 80 to $100 million a year proposition by the time it's fully built out. So that's some of the things that I'm working on right now. And happy to report that, you know, no shortage of people on the investment side looking to partner with us, you know, put some money into us. And we're trying not to be dilutive right now because, uh, I, I really want to build a strong base for our uh, existing shareholders. I was able to undo a merger last year where I took 18 and a half million shares back into treasury. So at some point in time, we'll probably reissue those, but we're not going to reissue them at 20 or 25 cents. We think that we're going to, you know, with, with continued good press, continued strong financial results, this share price should take care of itself and, and start going well north where it is now. You mentioned press. So, Every company we talk about and we talk to, they need catalysts, they need news. Is there some news and, and is there a lot of things cooking that, and that investors can anticipate coming along in the next you know, 30 to 60 days? Yeah, and I wish I could tell you some of the secrets that I have right now, but a um, couple of things. We all know that the U.S. is marching towards legalization now that we've, you know, the Biden-Harris uh, campaign has, has not only taken the White House, but they've taken the Senate as well, too. So you probably hear that every day about U.S. legalization, U.S. decriminalization, opening up banking, open up institutional lending and investment into our sector. So that's the number one driver right now. But we've got, you know, a lot of good news coming down the pipe. If the industry is consolidating and starting to consolidate, and we've certainly seen some news with the big boys, um, I'd like to think that we're having some conversations in that limited market in Nevada, where I think we could potentially vend in a couple of other smaller type players and sort of be a consolidator ourselves. And then we're sort of having some similar conversations in California as well, too. But everything's adding up to accretive M&A as you put one and one together, it equals three. You've got strong brand recognition. And then you've got, you know, sort of that not just organic growth anymore. You've got a, sort of a rocket ship that's that's ready to take off and everybody's looking to do deals similar to, it reminds me of the Canadian industry. If you go back 2015, 2016, 17 and 18, lots of M&A, lots of, you know, and again, the companies that I was looking after, it was like, who's got the real story? Who's got the sound fundamentals? Not just that sort of sell the sizzle on a, on a great investor deck, but not revenue generating. We're generating revenue here. And then some of the, you know, some of the, the opportunities that we have on the M&A side, it's going to bring in further revenue generation, further streamlining of the supply chain of the cost structures, making it more profitable to take one and one together and make it three. And then uh, we might even have a, a few opportunities with some celebrity endorsement in the Las Vegas market. Wow. Just again, as that pandemic sort of shifts away and tourism starts to come back, you're already seeing tourism start to come back uh, a little bit in Vegas. Um, I think that there's some really good days ahead for us. And again, everything's everything forward has been devised around a, a, a profitability strategy. Everything that we're going to do is going to have an instant ROI if we need to spend some money. And it's going to have a creative nature of, of a partnership of bringing one or two or several entities together. So pretty excited. Eric, if there was one thing you would want investors to know, and you want to leave this interview and this video with investors knowing about Fiora Cannabis, what would it be? Well, I think that uh, fundamentally sound business, again, focused on profitable growth, focused on a, on a clean balance sheet. Um, but I really point to that Las Vegas market again. It just it blew my mind when I first came on board. When you look at Canada, roughly 36, 38 million people in Canada. When you look at the one tourist market in Vegas and 42 million people are coming into that town every, every year once things are back to normal. And I actually was uh, doing some research because I like to... Um, I like to watch programs like yourselves and I like to see interviews of other founders and CEOs in the same marketplace that I'm in. And the founders of Planet 13 made a very a key sort of statistic in an interview two years ago. So again, two years ago, Nevada's just coming through, you know, full adult legal recreational use. Um, and, and they said, you know what, we're actually not even tapping into the tourist market. We're only getting about 17% 
of that tourist market. So 42 million people times 17%, that's nowhere near where it needs to be. And Planet 13 is the largest dispensary in the world. They're a great barometer or, or, or benchmark to use. So what I'd really like to see is, again, when you land there, when you, you, know, you take that taxi or that Uber to your, to your resort, all you're seeing is cannabis advertising, which we don't see a lot in Canada, if at all. You're seeing great branding, strong, you know, colorful packaging, and just really it's, it's everything you'd expect Vegas to be, which is fun, which is, you know, come in for a good time. And I really think that, you know, the interesting thing is that flour is still king there, which is a little bit ironic to me, because I think for that tourist, we are starting to think about and create those 2.0, 3.0 products, because you're, you're kind of contesting you know that alcohol game with the tourist right and you know you don't want to provide them with something that's going to make them want to go back to their hotel room and go to sleep you're going to want to provide them with a drink uh, an edible something that enhances that that nighttime experiences and allows them to basically have a have a something to replace alcohol with i think that's a huge opportunity so we're working ourselves in our own production house and kitchen as well as with some uh, close partnerships we have in the production space in Vegas to look at some uh, connoisseur type products in the, in the form of concentrates like a, an ice hash rosin, you know, stuff like that for the real connoisseur market. And then for that tourist market, you know, we've, we've got a couple of uh, product ideas that are coming down as well too. That's really meant to uh, distribute and dose properly for somebody who's just coming into Vegas for four nights. So I would say that the, the number one thing that I would want people to know about our company and where we're situated is that uh, both in, in Las Vegas, which we think has got the potential to eclipse Canada someday in terms of sales, they're about, they were on the path to about a billion dollars in, in, uh, in sales until the pandemic. Canada just finished uh, the, the most recent statistics were 2.6 billion. So still a long ways to go from a money standpoint, but you've got the population, you've got, you've got to tie into that, that uh, tourism. And then if we shift over to, to the Coachella Valley again, Palm Springs, again, really relying on tourism when it comes back, we're, but we're getting in front of it. We're partnering with the wellness spas. We're, we're, we're partnering with the resorts. We put together an e-commerce site where you can order and we'll deliver it right to your resort. You've got to drive right by our store on the way to Joshua Tree or on the way out to, uh, to, to the Coachella Music Festival and, and, and stuff like that. So we're already ahead of the game in terms of marketing and we're just basically waiting for tourism to come back. So that's the big thing for us is we think that we're in two excellent tourist markets, two great markets for Canadian snowboards to be coming down as well too. And uh, so we're taking all of our experiences that, that we've learned from the Canadian industry where I come from and, and a lot of our management and, and, and people come from as well. And we're really just waiting for the pandemic to be over and you know, we're doing good now. We'll be doing great by the time that all happens. That's fantastic. Eric Anderson, the CEO of Fiori Cannabis. Very excited about watching your company grow and evolve. And you've done a great job since you've taken over the helm. Like you said, from nine cents to where you are today, it's already up big and the reality is just getting started. Everyone who's watching this, just remember Rich TV Live is strictly for education and entertainment purposes. Always do your due diligence, always do your research before you invest in anything that we discuss here on Rich TV Live. Consult with a financial advisor. Chances are your financial advisor is going to say, yeah, it's a good pick. Our success speaks for itself. We've brought in winner after winner after winner, and I believe Fiori Cannabis is going to be a big winner for our community. If you like this video, please smash the like button, comment down below, share the video everywhere, and subscribe. And remember, if you're not winning, you're not watching, we bring you the winners, and we bring them to you first. Thank you for joining us, Eric. Continue the great work, and hope to have you on the show again soon. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for watching. This is Rich from Rich to be Live saying, have a nice day. We'll talk to you soon.